turn to Genesis chapter 11, and we're going to be um, looking at the Tower of Babel. <clears throat> we looked at the Table of Nations, and we looked at Nimrod this morning. And that's all largely in preparation for the Tower of Babel. And of course, uh, the Table of Nations is crucial for understanding redemptive history. But I'm going to read uh, 1 through 9. Now the whole earth had one language and one speech. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. <clears throat> then they said to one another, Come, let us make brick and bake them thoroughly. They had brick for stone and the asphalt for mortar. And they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top is in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower, which the sons of men had built. And the Lord said, Indeed, the people are one, and they all, they all have one language. And this is what they begin to do. Now nothing that they propose to do will be withheld from them. Come, let us go down. And there confuse their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of all the earth, and they ceased building the city. Therefore, its name is called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth. And from there, the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of all the earth. Now, the last historical information that falls under the title of the history of the sons of Noah, 10.1, is the Tower of Babel incident and the confusion of tongues. That Moses intended to deal with this important historical incident that explains how the various peoples, tongues, nations came into existence is proved by the mentioning of the division of the earth in the days of Peleg, 1025. Peleg is five generations after Noah and the brief history of Nimrod, who ruled over Babylon. Nimrod is three generations removed from Noah. The chron this chronology gives Nimrod sufficient time to develop an empire, consolidate his power, and embark on the massive building project of the tower. Okay, so when you read events in scripture and the history is condensed, keep in mind, it, it, you know, we might have a span of 100 years uh, for them to build the city and develop the tower. <clears throat> in, 10, uh, in 1110, the biblical story shifts from mankind in general to the believing line of Peleg in, in particular. And Peleg's brief history takes us directly to Abraham and the explicit calling out and formation of the Old Covenant Visible Church. And there are a number of um, introductory matters to consider. <coughs> Excuse me. Regarding this historical narrative. First, this brief history of the Tower of Babel is a brilliant example of Hebrew storytelling. Now, if you could read Hebrew... And I can't even read Hebrew fluently, but if you could read Hebrew, uh, the Bible's just mind-bogglingly amazing in its structure. It's obviously divinely inspired. <clears throat> Unlike a typical modern historical account, which simply sets forth events like a news story or a mere eyewitness account, the inspired Hebrew author uses a sophisticated structure and word choice to unify and emphasize the main points of the narrative. For example, wordplay, chiasmus, it's an inversion of phrases, clauses, or thoughts, <clears throat> a, a, a placing of words crossways and so forth, paranomasia, the use of puns in the Hebrew language. You know, a, a typical example in Hebrew, um, uh, aken, akened, okay, the, the, the verb is the verb form of aken's name showing that a sin is related to his name and so forth. And alliteration, the use of the same sound in two or more words. 
are some of the methods used. If you look at the structure of the chapter in Hebrew, it's, it's mind-bogglingly brilliant. Uh, it's, it's a work of art. It's incredible. And, and you see this throughout Scripture. You know, it's, it's one of the signs that Scripture is inspired. No man, <clears throat> especially some so-called peasant out uh, sheep herding, would be able to write such a thing without divine inspiration. <clears throat> now, keep in mind, Moses was well-educated, but still, divine inspiration was necessary. Second, the narrative contains a number of key teachings. We'll just briefly look at them here, and then we'll look at them more in detail later. Number one, it explains how the new humanity, which originally was one people with one language, became the many nations, peoples, and tribes described in the previous chapter. One of the main things that separates people into distinct uh, uh, nations with unique cultures is the difference of language. That's one of the main areas. <clears throat> Number two. The narrative tells us one of the chief ways in which the effects of the fall and rebellion against God will manifest, manifest itself in post-Diluvian history. It's a very important point. We'll get to this more later. While the sin and depravity of man does not change, the rise of civil government and empires, nations, and city-states focuses this rebellion into a new, deadly, powerful, concentrated form. It's much more dangerous. It's one thing if you're somebody living and you have to deal with uh, gangs in South Central L.A. It's another thing if you have a state coming after you. <clears throat> Before the flood, clanism and chaos prevailed, which was very decentralized and disorganized. Men were violent and wicked. There's no question. God destroyed the earth because of it. <clears throat> but Satan's empire did not have focus or unity of purpose. The rise of the large, powerful states built on new demonic cults, new false religions. Baalism, Ashtart, the Ashtaroths, and so forth. These things all developed in the Fertile Crescent, in the Sumerian culture, and so forth, and Nimrod. The rise of the false gods and the worship of kings. After the flood was an advance or progression of Satan's kingdom. Satan learns, he adapts. And we see this after the flood. This chapter reveals to us the basic character of anti-Christian kingdoms of this world. <coughs> false religion and statism is the devil's central method of controlling his followers. You see this in the book of Revelation also with the beast. Whether you think it's the papacy or whether you think it's Nero, whatever you think, or you're all millennial and you do just, it's a general principle, the application is the same. God's description of the manifestation of Satan's kingdom following the flood <clears throat> is the dark background that sets the stage for the introduction of the story of God's grace in and through Abraham. We need to be aware that the antithesis, antithesis, uh, the antithesis between the followers of Satan and the people of God continues in history. And that as God's kingdom progressively unfolds, Satan never ceases his attacks. His goal is a one-world humanistic state that actively persecutes Christians and rules as their own God, autonomously deciding good and evil. Today we have the United Nations, which is a, one of the most corrupt satanic organizations on the face of the earth. Number three. This narrative reveals God's sovereign control over all men and nations for the sake of his kingdom. <clears throat> men seek salvation through a status unity 
and man's effort to create the perfect humanistic religion or philosophy. God destroys this unity and punishes man's rebellion by decentralizing the monolithic state and forcing men to separate. Remember Jesus, a house divided against itself cannot stand. God divides the house of Satan in history for the sake of Christians. Even Islam is divided. Go to Iraq, Shiites are in Sunnis are killing each other left and right. Yeah, they're killing Christians too. But they hate each other's guts. <clears throat> Satan's attempts at a one world government for power and control are destroyed by God. <clears throat> Satan's empire is divided and weakened so that God's grace will triumph. Jehovah gives mankind one true religion. There's one way to heaven through the Lord Jesus Christ. There's one way to have sins forgiven through the cross of Christ. There's one way of obtaining salvation through faith. That's it. No works. Satan has many contradictory competing religions as different languages produce different nations, cultures, and religious traditions. Islam is satanic and Hinduism is satanic. You've got an Islamic state next to a Hindu state <clears throat> and they're at war with one another. And this is of the benefit of Christians. You do not want a one world monolithic state persecuting Christians, do you? This goal of a one world satanic empire has not diminished, however. Satan has adopted the strategy of having all nations adopt secular humanism religious pluralism and democracy so that one's religion can be relegated to only the private life. <clears throat> Why the scientific socialistic states can rule over all, all men and force Christians to submit to their world and life view or suffer the consequences. Christ will prevent this from happening through his rod of judgment and the victory of the gospel. Think of how brilliant the idea of secular humanism and pluralism is. Oh yeah, you can have your Buddhism and your Krishna and your Christianity and all your, all your religions. Yeah, you can have that. But it's, we're not going to allow any of it in the public school systems. We're only going to te teach the state religion. We're not going to allow any of that in the universities. And, and when we do talk about it, we regard it as a myth. We're going to control the judges. We're going to control the courts. We're going to control the schools. We're going to control uh, who is in civil government. You guys all submit to us. So in the guise of religious freedom, Satan is trying to establish a one world humanistic empire. And you have Europe being unified, the United States uh, and Obama loving Europe and wanting to be part of that and, and so forth. And then number five, <clears throat> it tells us that God is still concerned about the dominion mandate given to Adam and, the, and re then restated to Noah after the flood. God wanted mankind to spread out, populate and develop the entire earth, not simply the land of Shinar. Jehovah did not confound their language into many tongues because he had a problem with one language. Okay, it's not that God was a multiculturalist and he wanted several different cultures. That wasn't the issue. The issue was the dominion mandate. Mankind had existed with one language for over 2,000 years, with no complaints from God. The changing of the language was for dispersal, so the dominion mandate could be fulfilled, so that Jesus could be the Savior and Lord over the entire world. So it's interesting, when God gives a command to mankind, he doesn't forget about it. He doesn't cut man slack, even though thousands of years go by. It's still crucial to him. The dominion mandate still exists today. Well, let's look now at the historical setting. <clears throat> Before the sin of Nimrod and the people is identified, Moses gives us some necessary and important historical details. The inspired record tells us that the entire human race spoke one language during the period immediately after the flood. And obviously, 
we can, uh, before the flood, they all probably spoke one language too. <clears throat> this point makes perfect sense in that number one, all the people who lived on the earth descended from one family. And number two, the Tower of Babel incident, incident takes place only five generations after Noah. That's, that's 125 to 200 years. And his family stepped on dry land. Anybody who studied linguistics, I was a linguistics major in college for quite a while. <clears throat> Language changes very slowly. Now, uh, if you heard somebody from England from, let's say, <clears throat> 1600, you could understand them quite fine. There'd be some words you wouldn't understand. If you tried to talk to somebody from England from uh, 900, you wouldn't be able to understand them. Language takes a long time to develop. Now, we're 250 years removed from Puritan New England, and <clears throat> uh, England and America, uh, we can understand each other quite, quite well. There's a few words or differences, some pronunciations and accents that are different, but the language is essentially the same. It takes quite a while for language to change. <clears throat> now, Moses states this fact so that his readers will understand the division of this language at the end of the narrative. That's the point of bringing this up. Then we are told that a presumably large, uh, very large group of people migrated from the east and settled in a plain in the land of Shinar. <coughs> this statement raises a question in that Shinar, Babylonia, is southeast of Mount Ararat. Should not the passage say that they journeyed toward the east, not from the east? I don't know if you noticed that. Well, some scholars have suggested that this group of people first went past Shinar, perhaps probably on the north, and then hooked around and moved eastward back toward the Fertile Crescent. I think Alders offers a more plausible explanation when he says this, quote, It must be recognized, however, that the Hebrew expression from the east or out of the east does not always and probably does not even primarily mean from an easterly direction. It is generally used to designate a place to the east of a given place or a person in question. A good example of this use is given in Genesis 12, 8. <clears throat> Where we are told that Abraham pitched his tent toward the hills east of Bethel, Bethel, with Bethel on from the west and I on from the east. Here the same preposition is used. It clearly indicates that his location had Bethel to the west and I to the east with its location between these two cities. At the same time, it was located to the east in an easterly direction from Bethel. Genesis 12, 8 thus clearly indicates that the term out of the east in Hebrew usage can mean in an easterly direction. It depends entirely on the perspective from which the direction is indicated. In the same way, in the case of the descendants of Noah, it depends on what point of origin was from which their migration is described. There can be no doubt thus that the text implies that they were migrating in an easterly direction from where they had been. This is the understanding of the majority of interpre interpreters as well. And uh, end of quote. And I didn't, uh, I could have quoted Hebrew grammar and, and, and proved the same thing. <coughs> but I think, his, I think his statement was good. Now the area around the ark, if you've ever been to the foothills and mountains of Ararat, it's not good land to farm. It's rocky. Uh, it's unsuitable for farming. It's fine if you want to have a few sheep, but you can't really uh, have a good farm there, and you need good sources of water. When these people saw the fertile valley of Shinar with, with an excellent source of water, they decided to settle down. It's very flat. The soil's excellent. It's a very fertile soil with an excellent source of water. It's, it's a perfect place to settle. This area also contained clay, uh, which is excellent for building, uh, construction building. And it says they baked bricks and they used asphalt for mortar. And here we go, their civilization is born. This was an ideal place for the development of a new civilization. That's the historical setting. Now let's look at their sin. In verse three, we learn that the people became proficient in making bricks and building dwellings. 
That's verse 3. And then in verse 4, we are told of their sinful plans. Come, let us build for ourselves a city and a tower whose top is in the heavens. The phrase, a top, a tower whose top is in the heavens, means uh, an exceptionally tall tower. The statement clearly has religious overtones. From a human viewpoint, building a tower as high as the sky is an audacious undertaking. And it seems likely that in Genesis, uh, the account in Genesis views this as sacrilege, as a form of idolatry. For the sky is also heaven, the home of God, and the implication here is, is that they're this is their way of mediating unto God and meeting with God. This is their new false cult. And this ancient skyscraper was a human effort to become like God. Now this was mainly a decision of the political, religious leader, leaders with Nimrod as their king. Remember, Nimrod founded Babel. We're told that. And it was his kingdom. So obviously, he is the person in charge over this endeavor. It was the whole purpose of it being brought up in chapter 10. The people heartily approve of this undertaking. They wanted to build a gigantic pyramid-like structure called a ziggurat. If one examines the later history of Babylon and Sumeria, it is clear that this was a cultic religious structure. Okay, what takes place in Babylon and Syria after this descends from this day, from this, from this time, this act. Here's what Wiseman says. <clears throat> this archaeological form was developed in the 3rd millennium B.C. in Babylonia from a low temenos or platform supporting a shrine as at Erech and Ekwar, Erech founded by Nimrod, by the way, to the massive seven-story brick towers of Etamenaki, building which is the foundation platform of heaven and earth associated with the temple of Marduk at Babylon. <clears throat> Marduk was invented, it was the chief god of Babylon, named Esagila, literally, whose top is in heaven. That's what the, that's what they call their temple, whose top is in heaven, measuring 290 feet square at the base and about the same height. So you've got a very ancient structure, 300 feet high. That's a very, very tall structure. And on a flat plain, you could see it for miles away. Access to each level was by a ramp or stairway, which some uh, link with the ladder of Jacob's dream. Yeah, that's nonsense. On the top of this artificial mountain was a shrine where the god of the city was believed to descend to have intercourse with man in special rites. Several ziggurats have been excavated, those at Ur, that's in Babylon, Chaldea, Asher, Choga Zambiel being the best known and preserved. The Tower of Babel, Genesis 16, 1 to 5, uh, that's a misstatement, but uh, it should say 11, 1 to 5, might have been a ziggurat since they, have, they are to be found in all principal Mesopotamian cities. End of quote. Obviously, obviously, they were imitating the Tower of Babel. And these ziggurats can be found all over the world. They all serve the same purpose. They're shrines. They're religious shrines. They're political slash religious shrines. You have to understand that they didn't separate. They didn't have separation of church and state like the Bible has or modern states have. The emperor would be either a high priest to the false god or he would be connected with the false god. He was a sort of mediator between the people and the deity. Now, given the history of this area, it is likely that we have here the origin of a pagan religion that spread across the area. Even though God destroyed the tower. And I think, I think we have here the origins of idolatry. Now, men, any man who does not worship God is, in, in a sense, an idolater. Paul says covetousness is idolatry. But when we're talking about the worship of a false god with a false altar and a false temple and a false religion, it all originated right here, Babylon. Babylon. 
in every part of the earth where ziggurats were constructed, they were, they were symbols and cultic sites relating to religious and political power. This is true of the Middle East as well as the Americas. The Toltec, the Aztecs, the Mayas, <coughs> the Incas, all built ziggurats, some very large. And the king or emperor of their civilization would have a throne at the top of the ziggurat, and that's where they would conduct human sacrifices to their gods. So what happened in Babylon spreads throughout the world. As we study this passage, note the blatant rebellion against Jehovah. <coughs> we can assume that the godly remnant among the Shemites had nothing to do with this wicked endeavor. Just letting you know that. The fact that you have a bunch of people migrating there, the people of God had nothing to do with this, the godly Shemites. Now, their great set of the reasoning behind it is stated in verse 4. Let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. Well, there are a number of elements of their sin that are noteworthy. First, their plan of maintaining one monolithic state in one place was in direct conflict with the dominion mandate, which was stated to Noah and, uh, and Adam, which required men to explore and settle new frontiers. Man was required to multiply and fill the earth, Genesis 1, 28 and 9, 1. Man was to be an explorer. Man was to colonize. He was to settle the earth. This command had been passed down from generation to generation, and thus their commitment to congregate in one small plane was a high-handed sin against God. They're not that many generations removed from Noah. They know what they're doing is wicked. Jehovah said, spread out. Decentralize, explore, fill up all the empty spaces of inhabitable land. They said, we most certainly will not disperse. We will build a localized, unitary civilization. We will follow Nimrod, not you. He's a type of antichrist, isn't he? We will build an awesome, all-powerful, giant city of mankind. They placed themselves directly against God and his stated purpose for creating mankind. In fact, the singular city of man and the giant singular tower, which was the symbol of their new false religion and political power, were in essence to be symbols of their unity. Okay, you can just see John Lennon at the bottom of the tower singing Imagine. And they had stickers on their carriages, on their, on their chariots that said, uh, uh, what's that sticker? We, it coexist with all the religious symbols. They formed a statist cult. It was a statist cult. They rejected divine revelation for human autonomy. They rejected approaching Jehovah through the blood sacrifice of a clean animal Jesus Christ, which symbolized Christ, and sought to unite heaven and earth through Nimrod in the tower. Consequently, many older interpreters see Nimrod as prefiguring the beast, the man of sin, and that Antichrist, the popes of Rome. And Arthur Pink has a very lengthy discussion of this. He spends most of his time talking about the Antichrist. Now, the term Antichrist is always used in the plural in Scripture, and I don't think we should use it uh, singular unless we under, understand that there's more than one. The tower was to provide the rallying point and to be at the same time a token of their union of purpose. Here's the new humanistic religion of man. So we have statism. We have the invention of statism. We have the invention of false religion. We have the union of church and state against God, all this. And second, <clears throat> their plan was rooted in sinful pride. What were they seeking? Were they seeking the glory of God? Certainly not. They were seeking the glory of man. 
The city and the tower would be a permanent monument to their wisdom, their creativity, their power, their achievement. Look at what mankind can do apart from God. You know, beg this listening to the religion of Noah, offering an animal on a pile of rocks. We're going to build a nice crafted tower up to the heavens. We'll reach God on our own terms. Pride sees the word of God as unimportant. Arrogance rejects faith in Jehovah's commands and promises. For it sees oneself as the definer of truth, meaning, and blessing. And this, beloved, is the essence of humanism. <laughs> when you see Obama up there strutting his stuff and acting all arrogant and taking credit for everything under the sun and, and it being a habitual liar, he's just simply falling in the spirit of Nimrod. The people who built the tower were not concerned with what God thought. They only cared about receiving the praise of other humanists like themselves. <laughs> An obsession for fame and honor among the men of the world commonly inspires men to attempt great things that are contrary to the word of God. That are contrary to the word of God. This pride brings to mind immediately Napoleon, Stalin, Hitler. And it also reminds us of our culture's obsession with a meaningless name associated with complete vanity. A thousand years from now, do you think people are going to care about Beyonce and her crappy music? The focus must be on faith in God's word. Jesus Christ is the divine human mediator and the only atonement for sin and glorifying God. Fulfilling the Great Commission, the dominion mandate in salvific form. <clears throat> Our whole culture is evil and offensive to God. The United Nations is an abomination before his sight. President Obama and the White House and Congress and the Supreme Court are wicked following in the footsteps of Nimrod. And then third, this early humanism was a form of idolatry. And here's a quote from North, although 95% of the quote is actually Rush Dooney. North writes, again citing Rush Dooney, the Tower of Babel was an attempt to force this apostate thesis of ultimate oneness and equality unto all mankind. <coughs> This is from an article called the, the Society of Satan. In Gary Norse Christian Economics. The religion and virtue or ethics of Babylon was to be the fact of humanity. And community was simply in the common fact of humanity. In the city of God, community is through the Redeemer and God. In the city of man, the Society of Satan, <coughs> the ground of communion is the common humanity irrespective of any religious moral or moral differences. All differences must be suppressed in favor of the anonymity of union. The good life and the full life are in and through the state. The theological requirements for the unity of the Godhead require this faith in the unity of humanity. It's one true God. Hence, let us build a city, a one world order, an usher in paradise apart from God. Rush Duty continues. In terms of all this, the meaning of the proclamation, let us make a name, becomes clear. Let us be our own blessing, our own Messiah, Savior, and God. Let us be our own creator, our own ultimate source of meaning and definition. Let there be no value above and beyond us. Let man be the source of the definition, not the subject of it. Let man be beyond good and evil and beyond meaning, since he is himself the source of all definition. End of quote. Nimrod, the Tower of Babel. That's exactly what they're doing. That's the paradigm of Satan after the flood. Satan adapts. This is very clever. Let me focus my power in the state. Let us focus religion in idolatry and the state in false religion into one. And this is the teaching of the state school system in America. 
<coughs> the colleges, the universities, our federal government, the media, and our pop culture. Imagine there's no heaven, no hell below us, above us only sky, and on and on and on. That's a satanic hymn to the philosophy of Nimrod. And where John Lennon is currently, he doesn't imagine that anymore. The great synod will become the pattern of statism in all future generations, was the pride of the autonomous, godless, and pagan men seeking safety, security, salvation, and meaning through a humanistic unity and a false humanistic philosophy and religion instead, instead of salvation and blessing through faith in God and his word. Those are the two big alternatives in life. <clears throat> when I see Christian, professing Christians apostatize, they all apostatize to some form of Satanism, whether it's New Age thought, whether it's Roman Catholicism, whether it's atheism. The only authorized method of approach to Jehovah at this time was to offer a burnt offering on a pile of unhewn stone. That's what Noah did. God was to be approached through the blood of Christ. And this was a supreme act of humility and submission for it involved the acknowledgement that we are sinners that we cannot save ourselves, that we cannot depend on our own wisdom, that we are solely dependent on Jesus Christ, we're solely dependent on the word of God, we're solely dependent on the bread that comes from heaven for life. We cannot save ourselves. If we follow our own autonomous wisdom and creativity, we are doomed to destruction. And you people who looked up to Obama, who has accomplished absolutely nothing in five years other than destruction and debt, you're gonna be very disappointed when the dollar collapses and the economy collapses and all your status welfare programs collapse because there's no money. But humanistic man sees things quite differently. <clears throat> He begins with an assumption built on pride that man acting autonomously apart from divine revelation can determine meaning, truth, and ethics through science and human cooperation. The approach to God through the sacrificial death of Christ is seen as a foolish, antiquated superstition. Jehovah's divine revelation is seen as a collection of myths, of man-made stories, as the evolution of an ancient tribe's religious ex experimentation. That's what they teach in all the universities and college and liberal seminaries. No, only man acting scientifically can arrive at truth and achieve a blessing through rejecting the Bible and placing all their faith in man himself. That is the doctrine of modern man. That is what is taught in Europe, in America, in Australia, in Canada, New Zealand. That is the doctrine of modern man, of secular humanism. Man and only man can save mankind, and thus man is both God and Savior. And Obama encourages that. You want a free cell phone? You look to me. You want your, you want your payments, your welfare? You look to me. You want your food stamps? You look to me. You want free health care? You look to me. You want free this? You want free that? You want your goodies? Look to me. When Hillary Clinton was running for president, she actually ran an ad where she was Santa Claus doling out goodies from the state. The state is savior. And how can man achieve the salvation and blessing? The only way is through a grand focus and cooperation. And this requires state planning and control. This thinking has been the basis of statism and empire since Nimrod. What do you think the Tower of Babel was? It was a monument to humanism. The same with the Egypt, all the great monuments in Egypt. The same with the Aztecs and the Toltecs and the Maya. The secular humanist actually teach 
that Bible-believing Christianity is the enemy of mankind. That it is a foolish, evil superstition that is holding mankind back from true freedom, from achieving true peace and prosperity. If you listen to Bill Maher and these moron atheists, all the wars and evil of mankind come from religion. Well, yeah, there were religious wars and there were certainly problems. But the atheists and secular humanists of the 20th century killed all, more people in one century than all of the wars of the previous history combined. Adolf Hitler was an atheist. So was Stalin. So was Ho Chi Minh. So was Castro. So was Chairman Mao. But this whole pagan humanistic worldview fails to consider how all, that all the great humanistic power states were built on great human oppression and slavery. The pyramids of Egypt, the Areopagus in Athens, the great ziggurats of the Incas, Mayans, and Toltecs were all built by slaves. We look at the ruins of Rome and marvel at the beauty of the ruins of Rome. All built by slaves. A culture that makes man God debases and destroys man. Every pagan humanistic empire has been destroyed by God. The supposedly non-religious scientific socialist states of the 20th century were the most barbaric, bloody, and murderous regimes in all of human history. In all of human history. Pride goes before a fall. Until men recognize their sin and guilt and recognize that they are fallen creatures in need of Jesus Christ and his atoning death, their societies will all self-destruct or be destroyed by God. You know, in the, in the, in 19, in the 1900s, the 20th century, the only decade that I can think of that did not have disaster in it was the 1920s. The 10s, you had World War I, you had the flu epidemic. The 20s, well, you had a lot of crime going on because of stupid uh, anti-booze legislation. The 30s, you had the rise of fascism. You had slaughter going on in communist countries with, with Stalin. The 40s, you got World War II. The 50s, you got the Korean War. The 60s, you got the, Viet in the 70s, the Vietnam War. I mean, it's just, it's one hit disaster after another. Men thinks he can save himself and men brings nothing but disaster. <clears throat> Sinful men united by a messianic state think that they can solve mankind's problems and create a paradise on earth. But one cannot create a good society on a rotten foundation. Man's basic and original sin is to be as God, knowing good and evil. Knowing here has the sense, by the way, of determining or establishing so that man, uh, man's essential sin is to attempt to play God and legislate creatively and substantially on the nature of morality in terms of his own Godhead. And thus, if God's the Godhead, the modern Godhead says uh, men having uh, sexual relations and acting like animals, uh, if they declare that good, we're going to let them get married, so be it, because they create law. A study of history reveals that statists soon see that all their efforts are only making matters worse. Socialism in the welfare state subsidizes and produces more poor people <clears throat> as it punishes the producers and hurts the economy. It creates a society of leeches, of slaves to the state, now, do they admit that they are wrong in the face of overwhelming evidence? The United States, after spending four and a half, five trillion dollars on welfare programs, six trillion dollars on welfare programs, has not put a dent in poverty. Do they admit they made a mistake? No. Their pride and faith in mankind causes them to suppress the truth. Their presuppositions do not allow them to accept reality. Consequently, they live a lie. And they speak nothing but lies.
Think about it. Do liberal Democrats and socialists ever run a campaign on their accomplishments or the truth? No. The whole campaign is one of deception and lies because their policies don't work. They adamantly refuse to admit that their philosophy or worldview is a complete disaster and thus continue to attempt to make a good omelet out of rotten eggs. They attempt to avoid reality by lying and blame shifting. And most people believe that the lies and the deceptions because they have placed their faith in mankind and the state instead of Jesus Christ and his law word. Now you've heard the expression low information voters. Well, people vote this way because they're ignorant and stupid. No, people vote that way because they're evil. And there are people who are extremely intelligent, who have PhDs, who are leftists. Any fool can look at North Korea and South Korea and see, oh, capitalism produces this, socialism produces this. Any fool, a five-year-old can understand that, that statism is immoral and it is a disaster, yet they insist on believing in it because it's a faith. It's a religion. It's a faith in mankind. The current economic, monetary, and moral crisis in the United States is not, at bottom, a political problem, but a religious one. Men and women worship the state. <coughs> Men seek, man seeking to be God becomes less than man. Professing to be wise, they become fools. Christians should learn from the Tower of Babel that statism's goal is not genuine freedom or submission to Christ, but rather a society of Satan. And that's what we're building in America today. The Democratic Party is expli explicitly satanic. The Republican Party is a milder form of Satanism. A monolithic society where the human estate is God, Savior, mother, father, brother, and sister is what they want. It takes a village. Where people are slaves to the civil government and are trained to look to the state for every need and human happiness. <coughs> Everyone becomes a servant, a slave to the master state. This passage teaches us that those occupying the White House and the current crop and the Senate and the Congress are for the most part enemies of Jesus Christ and his kingdom. You know, God has given us passages like this. Christians should not be ignorant. Christians should know what's going on. Don't remain ignorant. Don't be a fool. Don't find yourself supporting some status monster. These people are, in essence, Satanists. They are modern nimrods who seek salvation through human in ingenuity and planning. And the solution, of course, is Jesus Christ. Place your faith in him. Place your faith in the word of God. Repent of statism. Repent of looking to the state for solutions. And say, let's do this. Let's all submit to the word of God. And I'm, when I say all, I mean the president, the Congress, the judges, the Supreme Court, the schools, the universities. Let's all submit to the word of God, not trust in ourselves, not trust in princes, not trust in human ingenuity. Let's trust in what God has said. Stop trusting in ourselves and let's see the amazing prosperity that follows. We'll continue this next week. Let us pray. Father, we give you thanks. You have revealed the pattern of wickedness throughout history in just nine verses. Christians need to take advantage of your word. Study it, trust it. And stop compromising with wicked people and stop compromising with socialists. Stop compromising with communists masquerading as Christians. Stop compromising with a bunch of anti-Christian bigots who hate Jesus Christ, who worship Satan. Help us, Lord, to bring reformation. Help us, Lord, to be obedient 
to the Great Commission. Help us, O oh Lord, to be obedient to the Dominion Mandate. Through Jesus Christ, in his name we pray. Amen.